right, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, your afternoon session of day two here at Google Cloud Next. My name is Drew Houghton. I'm a customer engineer on the machine learning team here at Google, and I work with customers that are using our Cloud AI platform to tackle challenging data science and machine learning problems. In this session, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that we have three customers who are going to share their stories using Cloud AI platform to solve some of these tough challenges. So we have a series of three lightning talks from Cruise Automation, from the American Cancer Society, and Spotify, who are going to talk about the different tools they're using on Google Cloud, the different philosophies that they're implementing in a machine learning use case uh, standpoint and from a platform standpoint. So we do have a uh, Q&A in the app. We, we call this a Dory. We, in, in the interest of time, we aren't going to be able to do a live Q&A, but if you want to submit questions through the, the Dory, We'll respond online, and then, as, as always, the teams will be here afterwards to answer some of your questions uh, if you want to stick around after the session. So with that, I want to, let's give a warm welcome to Brian Calvert from Cruise Automation. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Calvert. I'm a data scientist at Cruise Automation, and I'm the tech lead for the machine learning platform team. Today I'm going to talk to you about how Cruise is building our ML platform on top of GCP tools, services, uh, and software. And the kind of theme of this all is don't reinvent the wheel. We basically, we want our engineers to be focusing on Cruise-specific problems so that they can deliver the most value. Speaking of our engineers, uh, if you haven't heard of Cruise, we're a self-driving vehicle startup here in San Francisco primarily backed by GM, but we also have about $5 billion of funding from Honda and SoftBank. Uh, we basically were very focused on our mission, which is to build the world's most advanced self-driving vehicles to safely connect people with the places, things, and experiences they care about, and through this, transform the future of transportation. Six core behaviors that we live and breathe as we execute on our mission are stay safe, stay focused, work together, own it, seek truth, and be humble. Uh, being in the autonomous vehicle space, as you might imagine, ML is very integrated into our development and tech stack. We have an extremely diverse set of ML applications at Cruise that run the gamut from simple to complex, research to production. These include things like object detection, trajectory prediction running on our cars, fleet management in the cloud, safety modeling, active learning, and that spectrum is a challenge in its own right to support, but there's also two primary unique challenges to Cruise when it comes to ML development. One of those is the scale and complexity of data. We have a fleet of cars driving around in San Francisco. It's a crazy complex driving environment. These cars are equipped with arrays of high resolution sensors collecting lots like multi-petabyte scale of semantically rich high dimensional data it's basically like a you know, data scientist dream from a sandbox perspective to play around with. And speaking of driving in San Francisco, this leads us though to our second challenge. We have real world cars driving in the world, interacting with real people. Safety, as I said, stay safe. Safety is a core principle of the company. So we have things like safety drivers, extensive integration testing before we launch uh, code to the car. But this also plays out in our ML workflows. Traceability, reproducibility, these are core requirements. We, we do not sacrifice on them. But we have these complex workflows, so we have to have very solid tooling to basically facilitate that, that traceability. So this is where the ML platform comes into play, how Cruise basically delivers value to our ML engineers through our ML platform. We have three core product areas, data preparation, training experimentation, and model deployment. They basically match one for one with core parts of an ML workflow. It's a kind of combination of interfaces, so like SAS style, along with uh, frameworks for defining abstract computations, and then of course the execution layers to execute said computations, so a pass. And there's these three principles that are part of it. A unified, streamlined experience for our end users, end-to-end -end tracking of workflows, as I mentioned before, and then this, this other part, which is an emphasis on discoverability and ML democratization. We basically believe at our core that a diversity of opinions, technical backgrounds, those are going to be the key to success for us as a company. But as I mentioned earlier, there's a spectrum of ML workflows we have to support. So this is kind of where MLP's challenge comes into play, Cruise's MLP, is how can we make 
These principles on the left work across this full spectrum on the right, while of course still being robust, scalable, so on and so forth. And this is what the rest of my talk's gonna focus on. As you'll see, the crux of our solution is basically to build unified tooling and abstractions in both a horizontal sense and a vertical sense. This is maximizing the breadth and depth of what our platform can serve. And a critical component of this, the kind of what I got to at the start of the talk, is leveraging existing solutions whenever possible. Don't reinvent the wheel. We want our MLP engineers to focus on crew-specific problems so that they're delivering the most value. The first of these problems is data. Basically, any ML workflow is gonna involve lots of data flowing through the system. And uh, this data is fundamentally heterogeneous in nature. You have things like model binaries, which are just binary artifacts. You have structured feature data. You have the containerized ML applications themselves, each of them with their own different storage backend, or often with their own different storage backend. The MLP, we need to maintain touch points on all this data flowing through the system as well. Part of it is that traceability and reproducibility, reproducibility part, sorry. And then the other part is even end user features like orchestration. We have to know where all the data is because one workflow might deposit a payload of data into the workflow tracking and another one needs that at a later stage. So how we actually solve this, as the diagram implies in the text, is federated storage. We basically have a unified DSL so users don't have to worry about this. They can hit this DSL, register artifacts that are important. The dispatcher will manage the backend specific APIs. This naturally provides a single point of truth for tracking workflows end to end. So we've got our data under wraps, we've got it under control. And this brings us to then actually streamlining the different parts of the ML workflow itself. The first of this being data processing, preparing the data for you know, ingestion by models downstream or eventual, of course, deployment of the models themselves. Similar to the scale and complexity and spectrum of workflows of ML workflows period, the models, our data processing itself has this whole spectrum it covers. You have simple things, sampling, selecting, repackaging data, maybe into, say, TF records for ingestion by TensorFlow. But we also have very complex data processing. Let me re-simulate the entire AV software stack, AV autonomous vehicle. Like, let me change my localization algorithm and see how that affects my downstream tracking. Um, use that as a feature extractor. Each of these jobs, they have their own unique dependencies, or many of them do. And so you, you kind of immediately have this challenge of, like, how do I solve this? And one idea is, okay, let's target the upper bound. Let's build a single, super complex backend that's going to manage all of this. If it can hit the upper bound, it can hit the lower bound. That's not a pragmatic solution. One, your SREs, they're, they're not going to enjoy uh, dealing with that. Two, it's, of course, as part of that, going to challenge your SLAs. But also from this kind of applicability standpoint, it's basically taking a sledgehammer to a finishing nail for many of your workflows. Of course, at the other end of the spectrum where you just you know, let bedlam chaos, scattered backends, whatever, that's also not going to work. That's explicit fragmentation. It adds cognitive load to your users. So we need some form of unified solution that kind of toes that line and balances it. And this is where Terra comes into play. Instead of unifying everything, we, we unify the pipeline definition part. So Terra is a unified DSL or SDK for data processing jobs. We use Apache Beam for the pipeline definition. It's a very like native, like MapReduce native style DSL. This gives us native integration with uh, workflow tracking by basically building on top of this. It allows us to support multiple different compute backends through basically a runner dispatcher. We can have a data scientist and ML engineer define a pipeline. The dispatcher can go, oh, this is a simple workflow. I can deploy it to Dataflow, or this is a very complex, that simulation workflow, and deploy it to our custom simulation backend of, uh, called Cruise Hydra. And so what this lets us do is, is leverage scalability out of the box. For example, Dataflow for these simple jobs, it's, it's super, super easy to use as an example. And even for our custom stuff, we build it on top of GCP to manage the compute part of it. One other component I want to hit on is this democratization bit. By unifying on a, on a DSL here, we've basically uh, gotten ourselves kind of free sharing of operators, feature extractions, et cetera. So we've got our data prepared. And now we want to train models. And we kind of hit the same, same problems. We have a myriad of different frameworks, complexity of their requirements. How can we unify all this, especially given that ML models are often that most black box part of the workflow, where there's this ubiquitous need for clear prescriptive traceability. 
The diagram looks very similar to the last one because it's a very similar way you can solve this is unify your definition. Unify your definition of pre-processing transformers, your primitives of what is a model, and then you can dispatch to the appropriate backend. If it's a scikit-learn, we can train on a single machine. If it's some crazy multi-layer deep neural net doing temporal convolutions, use Horvod, deploy it on GK, custom MPI cluster. So we've prepared our data, we've trained our models, and now we want to deploy our models. Similar story as the other problem areas. Varied requirements, complex dependencies. So of course, given a similar problem, you have similar solutions, which is namely leveraging the kind of abstractions or unifications at the abstraction level, the DSL level. Work with DAG-based frameworks. This is giving you strong semantic structures. So each node telling you what it needs Given you have all that, the DAG itself can tell you what it needs, so you can encapsulate it as this kind of black box operator. Of course, once you have a computation with explicit semantic expectations, that is a containerizable computation, so we can put this black box transformer into a container, gRPC endpoints, throw protobufs in and out. Once I have a container with gRPC, I have a deployable microservice or a deployable application into any application layer, so we basically promoted ML to now transform it into a microservice that lets us do it for whatever purposes, whatever business logic we need. And of course, leveraging GCP, for example, for GKE to manage these Kubernetes pods. So to kind of summarize it all back, there's this, this huge spectrum of ML at Cruise. Uh, research to production, simple to complex, and for us to serve that from the MLP side, we basically focus on core ML primitives for building these workflows. Things like unified frameworks and principles, DAG-based, low-level primitives, like what is a model. Uh, we also provide relevant abstractions for multiple levels of complexity. We want to abstract away compute, storage layers, task-specific DSLs. This is, of course, facilitating then building more complex things. These are your Lego blocks. As part of that, we don't want to necessarily focus on how are we dealing with storage or compute or the deployment of applications. And so that's where we leverage GCP's tool suite to provide us stable, scalable solutions. And this, this kind of brings me to my closing point. The same one I opened up with is as you're working on these applied AI in your own companies, don't reinvent the wheel. Understand where existing tools and services and open source software slot in and have your engineers proactively build on top of that. This is exactly where they can deliver the most value. It's gonna lower your technical risk. It's gonna accelerate time to market. Kind of one, one closing point about that is even with all this uh, storage compute, all that, you should obviously leverage that. But of course, if you don't need super complex DSLs, you could use things like TFX, TensorFlow, Kubeflow pipelines. So the whole point here is that you want your company to have your AI in production as quickly as possible, traceability, reproducibility, all these principles not being sacrificed. With that, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. That's a great example of giving data scientists and uh, ML researchers from the platform side the best of uh, scalability but ease of use. So with that, our next speakers are uh, Mia Gaudet from the American Cancer, uh, Cancer Society and Jake Evans from Slalom. If we could give them a warm welcome. Hello. Uh, so Jake and I want to talk about a project um, that initiated um, because they, uh, at Slalom, they had lost a colleague to cancer and wanted to do something to um, pay back. Uh, the community and in his honor. And so they had approached the American Cancer Society about doing uh, some work and through um, some conversations had pieced together um, a project that would really utilize the long-term investment that the American Cancer Society has made in um, gathering data resources for cancer research and utilizing the machine learning expertise at Slalom. So we wanted to focus on breast cancer as an important public health problem. Uh, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death in women in the US. 
So they're within breast cancer, even though it's all in one site, breast cancer is actually um, several different diseases. And we can tackle this understanding of the different ways to define these different subtypes of breast cancer through multiple different ways. And so in this project, we're focusing on the actual tissue specimens and what the tissue specimen looks like under a microscope. So traditionally, and in the clinic, a pathologist would make the final diagnosis of a breast cancer. And they do this by looking at the different cells, what they look like under the microscope, and being able to distinguish between cancer cells and non-cancer cells. And they also provide, pathologists regularly provide in the clinic, some other characteristics about the cells. But to go beyond that and to, under, to look for novel characteristics, there's a lot of difficulties that a pathologist face. So some of that is the subjectivity of describing these cells, what they look like in relationship to each other, as well as um, it can be very time consuming to look at uh, different patterns, to score these different patterns across many different types of, in many different uh, patients as well as um, there are pathologists are very much needed in the clinic and there are not enough pathologists for the research. So this is really a problem that can be solved through machine learning. Uh, because of the consistency that we get through algorithms, as well as we get more precision, as well as quantification, um, compared to a pathologist making a, a descriptive qualitative um, a score, as well as then we can score this to many, um, many different people uh, across many patients, across many people um, in a large research study. So in one of these research studies is the American Cancer Society's Cancer Prevention Study 2. And this is a cohort study, which means we collect uh, information about people, we recruit them, collect information about them when they are cancer free and then follow them over time. And during that time, we collect blood specimens, we collect uh, questionnaire information that includes questions about lifestyle and diet and medical factors. And so you can see that we're quickly accumulating a lot of data on these individuals and then link them to national registries about who gets cancer and who doesn't, as well as who dies of that cancer and who doesn't. And so in this project, we used about 1,700 uh, breast tissue specimens from women who had been diagnosed with breast cancer in the cancer prevention study too. So when you think tactically about this problem, how do we take what are originally just small glass slides with these specimens on them and extract novel patterns that exist within them and then organize that information in a way that can actually be folded back into more traditional studies linked to clinical outcomes? That journey is a, is a pretty long and complicated one, and we're going to be talking about those tactical steps here for the remainder of the presentation. Originally, these slides are just that, glass slides, with what look like very small pink blobs on them. But when you put them under a microscope, you see a wealth of information, down to even the cellular level. You can see things like red blood cells and individual cell nuclei. That's a, a ton of information, but unfortunately, we can't use our preferred toolkit to actually do any analysis on it, right? Um, what we want to do is we want to move that information uh, to the cloud. So the first step to do that is actually to digitize these, um, these slides. A lab at UNC did that for us using modern microscopes, and they digitized them in a way that is a, a proprietary format, but allows us to actually zoom in and out at different objective magnif magnification levels so that we can capture both macro and micro level patterns. From there, we actually move those proprietary image files to the cloud, and our journey really begins using GCP. We do the standard pre-processing that many analytical projects take. Uh, we clean the data up where it's dirty, we normalize things where necessary, and then we actually use some really cool deep learning techniques to identify and extract the patterns that exist within these images. The advantage of doing this is that it's a completely unsupervised technique. So we take the human outside of the equation, which removes the inherent biases that always come when a human is, is trying to do uh, really any sort of problem. From there, we encode that information and organize it in a way that can actually be linked back to some of the more traditional studies, as I mentioned, um, that can be linked to uh, actual patient outcomes. 
In terms of the tool set that we use, um, just a quick overview. We leverage Google Cloud Storage a lot in this project, not only to hold those raw files, uh, but also to hold all the interim information as we are processing those raw files and then the actual output from the machine learning steps. The processing piece is actually done completely by scratch uh, in Compute Engine. It's completely scalable, which allows us to convert these proprietary image files into normalized, ready-to-be-analyzed files um, on the machine learning step, which, of course, we use ML Engine for in order to train the model at scale. The model vetting process was done in Data Lab uh, using primarily uh, Keras and TensorFlow. So when um, these slides are made, they are, um, the tumor is removed from um, a woman when she's diagnosed with breast cancer, the tumor is removed, uh, it is put into uh, formalin, which stops any cellular activity, then put into wax to maintain the 3D structure of the tumor, and then slices are taken um, of the tumor, it's very thin, and then put on the glass slide. And then the pathologist stains them with a stain that allows uh, the, the different components of the tissue, the different cells that, uh, that Jake described, to be visible under the microscope. And, but this staining process has changed over the last uh, couple of decades, and these tissue specimens have been collected since 1993 through 2015, as well as across hundreds of hospitals in the US. So you can imagine that there's a lot of variability there introduced from that, as well as some of those slides and the stains sitting around also uh, fade over time as well as the pathologist, as you can see from these uh, images here, the pathologist circle areas that might be of interest um, and make other notations at their own will, not knowing, of course, that they would be valuable to us at this point um, now as a digitized image. So that was really, a, a, a getting rid of these artifacts was an important first step to overcome. Definitely, and again, from a tactical point of view, the way that we can overcome each of these hurdles that Mia mentioned is to use our preferred toolkit for doing some of these pre-processing steps. Um, for us, it was using Python and all of those rich libraries uh, that we can do image processing with. Um, but the first step is to convert these images from that proprietary format, which is called Leica SEN, into something more accessible that we can actually read into Python. That's a TIFF format because it's lossless. So in order to do that, uh, we investigated some open source libraries, and there are some that exist out there, but unfortunately, because the file type uh, that was specific to our problem uh, was so new, there was nothing out there that existed that could successfully convert this file type from like a SEN, again, into a TIFF format. So one of the software engineers on our team dug into the actual source code of one of those open source libraries, altered it a bit, and successfully converted each one of these 1,700 images from Leica SEN to a TIFF. From there, we actually go about um, removing all of this image noise that Mia just described, the first step being to normalize the colors that exist within the images. From slide to slide, a purple nuclei should be a purple nuclei should be a purple nuclei. But unfortunately, due to the reasons Mia mentioned, that's not always the case. So, we did some uh, pixel level clustering in order to coerce the range of colors that exist within and across each of these slides to the same range uh, for that color consistency and in a way that loses no information. From there, we go on to computationally identify each of these artifacts that Mia described. Use these pin marks that you're seeing here or Sharpie marks. There's also some ink that's sometimes left over um, after making the incision for the tissue sample. So we wanted to identify which regions actually had too much noise that we wouldn't be able to do any uh, machine learning with. From there, uh, we perform what's called image tiling. This is breaking this very large image, which I failed to mention. These images are absolutely large, absolutely massive rather around 10 gigabytes on average um, in their raw state, which you can imagine is you know, thousands by thousands of pixels. So from a machine learning standpoint, uh, we want to you know, explode the number of samples that we have uh, while also reducing the noise, which is what image tiling does for us. It reduces each of these large images into smaller sub-images, and then from there we can actually filter out those tiles with little to no useful information. So we filter out tiles with uh, primarily white space and also those which are primarily composed of artifacts. 
what we're left with is this collection of really information-rich tiles that we can feed into a really complicated um, but very intelligent deep learning model to identify patterns and encode them uh, in an intelligent way. That model specifically is a convolutional autoencoder. Um, so the way that that works is we feed it each image tile uh, and it distills it down into a simpler form called a, a feature vector. That feature vector is just a sequence of numbers, um, around 500 or so floating point numbers, and then using that feature vector, the autoencoder tries to recreate the original image. This process of distilling down and recreating across the entire collection of tiles forces the autoencoder to learn the patterns that exist within each of those images uh, in a way that is you know, really robust and really salient. These feature vectors are uh, then used in the next step, which is clustering. As a human, if you're just gonna look at 500 floating point numbers, it's probably a little bit more difficult than actually looking at the raw image itself to identify patterns. But to a clustering algorithm, you know, this is actually the, its preferred format. So we cluster each of these um, feature vectors and we actually perform this clustering process two times. The first time uh, we find 10 clusters and we call these, pri sorry, we call these primary clusters. Um, this is dominated by white space in terms of the differentiating factor between each cluster. And then within each one of those clusters, we perform a second round of clustering in order to capture some of that variance that was lost from that initial round. Um, and that also allows us to look at some of the, uh, the nuances in the feature vectors, um, which again is an, are analogous to the actual patterns that exist within each one of these images. Now this machine learning portion of the process, especially the autoencoder portion, is really compute intensive. The autoencoder has around 50 million uh, free parameters that it learns uh, over its training process which is, you know, it's, that's a ton, right? Through some hacky uh, ways, we got this to run on a local computer, but what took, you know, multiple days on a local computer took around a few hours using ML Engine. So Google Cloud really helped us out on this front. From here, uh, we have these, these secondary clusters, and that's really what you're, what you're looking at here. So each row is going to be one unique secondary cluster, uh, and uh, the actual images are the most representative images for that cluster. Now, I'm a layman, I'm no uh, pathologist or epidemiologist, but I can see you know, some very interesting differences between each one of these, but I think the more interesting question um, to ask is how uh, does this relate back to things that are actually important, like patient outcomes? Yes, so uh, the great thing about these different clusters is that we were both able to identify clusters that seem to be picking up on things that we knew that it might pick up on. Um, so one of those things is referred to as tumor grade, and we would expect it to be picked up on an image-based analysis because as the tumor becomes more and more aggressive, the DNA in the, in the cell center gets more and more disordered and clumped up and then becomes darker and darker. So of course, we were, we were reassured that we would expect to see that as a cluster, this, uh, something that is related to tumor grade. Um, because of this visualization aspect of it, but as well as we saw clusters that were, we have no words to describe uh, because it was something that the machine could pick up that a pathologist couldn't. So uh, it, we got both um, clusters that had a, a known entity as well as novel uh, features. So uh, we're utilizing these clusters now in combination with this uh, long-term data that we've been collecting to both look at, for these women, we're looking at are there risk factors that are related to having a predominance of one cluster over another to provide us some insight into the etiology or what caused the breast cancers, as well as then are these clusters related to long-term survival? Um, and we are working on, that, uh, on those analyses now. As well as now, we also wanna see, this was done in the Cancer Prevention Study too, but we wanna see, can we replicate it in our more recent cohort study referred to as Cancer Prevention Study 3? And also, uh, we've been talking about breast cancer, but this algorithm could also be very relevant to other cancer sites, like colon cancer or, or ovarian cancer, and as well as we wanna share this information with other, other groups too. 
um, because certainly there's many applications to uh, machine learning and AI in the medical space to really, particularly in imaging, uh, to better, to go beyond what the clinicians can do. So I just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to thank Slalom and Google for their generosity in making this project possible for us. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's a fantastic example of how applied machine learning is becoming more and more a transformative part of healthcare and potentially saving uh, many, many lives. So for our next, our last session, I'd like to welcome up to the stage Mark Romain and Joe Cotaruccio from Spotify. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm here with my colleague, Mark. And we are both machine learning engineers at Spotify. And today, the plan is for us to talk to you a little bit about recommender systems. But before I go a little deeper into some of the machine learning that underlies these recommender systems, I want to talk to you a little bit about music. Music, albums, tracks, artists, playlists, these things for, are the entities that form the item space for our recommender systems. Our fundamental task is to give you music you'll love, to give you things that will resonate. Music joke. But before I can do that, I need to ask a much more simple question. As a user, what music is pretty good for you? I need to turn this entire space of items into a smaller but still sizable set of relevant items. We call this process candidate generation. Once I have an idea of what the relevant items are, I need to fine tune things a little bit more. The product proposition dictates how I'll turn these candidates into awesome recommendations. For example, maybe I want to turn them into a playlist with a very specific objective, like discover new music you love. Or maybe I'm interested in clustering these items together into mixes. Maybe I want to pick out items that match something you're already listening to. There are infinite possibilities with one common thread, being able to turn preference for music into math. How do I do that? If I was to ask you if you loved a certain artist, you could probably tell me, yes, no, maybe, not sure. I need to somehow predict that response. So I need some mathematical operation between users and items to equate to preference or predicted preference. OK. So one straightforward way is to cast the preference problem as a matrix reconstruction problem. OK, there we go. Specifically, if I have users and items, and using historical data, I extract some interaction measure. For example, did the user play the track? This represents an observed proxy for preference. And this is what I'm going to try and predict. I then attempt to find some representation of users and items, here denoted UI and IJ, such that if the user interacted with the item, an operation between these two vectors will lead to a predicted value of that interaction measure. Hopefully, it's close to the observed value. In the picture above, for, above, for example, uh, this operation would be a dot product between the two vectors. In the diagram, the vectors are two-dimensional. This two-dimensional vector space is therefore my preference space. More generally, if I have a user and some features I can use to describe them, and an item also with some features, I can try to use these features to learn these latent factors such that an operation between the latent factors approximates the measure of interest. And so what you end up with at the end of the learning procedure is a vector space that co-locates users with the items that they'll love. Sounds great, but there are many, many methods you can use to accomplish this task, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. For example, maybe I have a model that does exceptionally well, but it takes a long time to train and requires a lot of training data. Regardless, I for sure have multiple models that I need to analyze and compare. And this is the problem. I have many experiments I need to run and keep track of. Okay. Moreover, with a large item space and relatively low interaction density, I'm going to need a good bit of training data to actually produce a meaningful model. 
And I'm going to need to track experiments on a large amount of data. Now, offline experiments are nice, but online experiments are a lot better, right? You'll never know how the recommender system will perform until you try to test it live. But if I'm constantly iterating on these models, and the only really way to know what's successful is to launch it live, I'm going to need to tightly couple my experimentation environment with my production environment. It all sounds a little bit daunting. Before you even mention machine learning, it's a pretty interesting infrastructure problem. Yeah, so as Joe said, we want to do it given the constraints of our production stack. Um, so we wanted to try Kubeflow pipelines and TFX that said that it would solve this for us. So basically, the conversation you see here on the slide was very close to what we had, me and Joe, in the beginning of this project. Um, and to unpack a bit what I tried to say here, let's take one step back and try to figure out what we're actually trying to do here. So we're trying to push the boundaries of recommender system in order to improve the experience of our users. Um, and what we're actually trying to do is very close to this quote that I love from Giorgio Benjuo, which is, research is like a random exploration guided by intuition. It's okay to fail, but it's more important to try. And this is one of like, the core beliefs we have when building out this infrastructure. We wanted to have infrastructure that let us move faster and try more things. And by trying more things, we would build up more in, like, a better intuition and give us a better idea what to try next. Um, so what we're trying to do is uh, like, uh, faster our iteration cycle and actually lower uh, the time for an idea to the production. Because as Clemens, Clemens, uh, the PMM, PM from TFX uh, mentioned, um, research often leads to production. So we want to be able to do, uh, to, to uh, make it very easy to go from an idea to production. Um, and this is very important, as you already mentioned, because it's quite hard in an offline session uh, 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 fashion for a recommender system to know if you're actually doing the right thing and actually improve the, um, the experiments for a user. Um, so the way we do that is we run a, bunch, a lot of A-B tests. Um, but in order to get to A-B tests, we need to put our models in production, and it is quite hard, especially since the big scale of Spotify um, and our latency requirements. So when we started thinking about what kind of infrastructure we needed for this, um, we started by thinking what do we actually need? So Joe started by basically zooming in on this orange box. But if you zoom out a bit, there are many different areas we have to think about. We have to think about data collection, feature engineering, serving infrastructure, in order to successfully go from an idea to production. Um, so in order to like, accumulate this, we needed some common infrastructure. But we weren't the first one to actually get this problem. So we started by having some inspiration from other companies. So we started reaching out to other big tech companies. We started reading a bunch of uh, research papers and tried to figure out what is actually important here and come up with a set of requirements. Um, so the set of requirements were essentially uh, coming up uh, with tooling uh, for experiment tracking, uh, mostly like uh, preferably a UI, um, make it easy to run big distributed workloads. So especially with our scale, we have big models that train on multiple GPUs or multiple CPU nodes. Um, we wanted to be very flexible. Um, since ML is changing so rapidly, we wanted to don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time, but just build one infrastructure that is very flexible. Uh, we want to allow for easier hyperparameter tuning, because you can get a lot of gains by doing proper hyperparameter tuning. And we wanted to do all of this in Python, because this is the uh, language of choice for most of our data scientists and machine learning researchers. So we want them to build those pipelines within a language they know. Um, so we decided to go for TFX and Kubeflow pipelines because those were both open source and it seemed to be well supported in Google Cloud. The issue was that it were quite early stage projects, so we knew we were taking a risk, but we saw great potential, so we went for it anyways. Um, so what is TFX? TFX is a, um, a platform for end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines, and it basically consists of several components that actually are extremely useful when to go from an idea to production. So to start with, there is the example gen. So it takes in either CSV or BigQuery and outputs TF records. And TF records is the data format of choice for TensorFlow. It's basically a certain format in Protobuf. And then the first component it has is the data validation. So basically, you have a bunch of data, and you want to know statistics for these data. So you want to know how these features are um, behaving. So you want to know histograms, min, max, number of missing values. 
And these is, things are useful for a few different ways. Uh, one is for feature engineering, so this is the next step. So actually taking this raw data and outputting it in a vector form and basically start doing the math that Joseph described earlier. Um, and the other thing you want to do is you want to be able to see and detect uh, drifting features um, and anomalies in the data. So we have, if we have a model and we train it on a bunch of data and then we collect more data from it, we want to see if that data that is coming in is, is fundamentally different to the one before. Because if so, then the model performance is going down and we want to retrain. Um, and then it provides a trainer component that basically takes in an estimator, uh, the estimator API in, in, um, in TensorFlow, and is able to, um, in a distributed way, execute this on either Kubernetes or on ML Engine. And then the last part is basically a model analysis. So if we train our model on a bunch of data, and we have a bunch of data that we didn't use for training, we want to see how our model performs on that data that we didn't use for training. And this, data, this model analysis component basically comes with a UI, and it allows us to break our predictions down in different dimensions. I will come later why that's actually useful. And then the last few parts is basically seeing if the accuracy of your model is good enough, and if so, you want to push it to production. And the nice thing of TFX is that it comes with this metadata layer. So every component outputs all the artifacts into the metadata layer, and therefore we can do things like lineage tracking. So if we have a model, we actually could tell, we could ask the metadata layer, okay, what was the data that was this trained on? And it's actually able to tell us. Um, and we could do things like, okay, give us the, the distributions of my data uh, given this model. And then the second part of our stack is Kubeflow pipelines, which is very complementary to TFX. Um, it's able to do things like experiment tracking. We can see the output of our runs. Um, it comes with a Python DSL, so every data scientist or machine learning engineer could actually um, construct these pipelines and then execute them on Kubernetes uh, because Kubeflow pipelines is both the orchestration layer as well. So uh, every step or component in the pipeline is actually a Docker operator that runs in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that is very good because it allows a certain amount of isolation. So we can do things like sharing components throughout the company. So part of our work is actually coming up with like specialized recommendation components that then the rest of Spotify could use in a natural way, all within Python. Um, so taking all this in together, uh, after a couple of sprints of work, we got to all the initial um, rough edges uh, because as I said before, it's still a bit early stage. Um, and it took us around like a month to port our whole infrastructure to this new stack, but we saw great benefits from it. Uh, we went from uh, a month or two months from one model iteration to the next, got it down to a few weeks, and now we're in a matter of days. Um, so basically, we're using Kubeflow pipelines to run end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning pipelines using the TFX components and a bunch of our own custom components. Um, and next to the increase in iteration speed, we also got more control and we got more understanding what our model is actually doing. So here you see a visualization of this data validation, uh, the model analysis component that I mentioned earlier. And what it basically did is it executed a pipeline in a distributed fashion and is able to break down your data in certain dimensions. So an example for us why this is useful, we can take a model and then break it down per market so we could actually see how well our model is doing per country. And this is very important for us because music culture varies a lot from one country to the other. Um, and here you see the plot of our improvements in model accuracy. So here, like the blue line is randomness, and you see if we go further up in the left upper corner, uh, the better it is. So we see with each iteration, we actually improve our offline metrics, and we are very confident given this new stack and given the, the, the increase in iteration speed that we can keep improving this. So to wrap it all up, um, we encourage everyone to try TFX and Kubeflow pipelines because it provides a lot of value for us. Um, we think that it's very good that there are two tools available that are developed in the open source. So we encourage everyone to start contributing back and making ML pay running ML pipelines less painful and making it better for everyone. Thank you.